Hi, my name is Lenora Faye. I'm a child-free lifestyle content creator, speaker, and moderator, most notably for the 2021 Virtual Child-Free Conference, which you can now watch on YouTube. I am also the creator of The Bitchy Bookkeeper, which is a child-free lifestyle brand, and I host a morning show called Child-Free Morning Chat. Hi, I'm Kristen Ketsey. I'm a writer, most recently of the novel The Age of the Child, which is heavily child-free informed. But you can also find me on Medium, um, Kristen Tetsy, uh, where I do a lot of child-free related content also. Hi, I'm Isabel. I am the founder of The Uprising Spark. I help child-free women work through their feelings that may come to us about our decision, like insecurities or fears or guilt. There's just so many of them. Uh, I'm also the host of the Ona Supper podcast, and I am actually hosting the first child, all child-free women only trip next year. So you can find more about that later. And the three of us are the three founding non-mothers of Child Free Girls. And today we have a return visitor. Three Schechter is here with us. How are you? I'm I'm great. I'm so glad to be back here. This is awesome. We're it's been so my happy. dream to return. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we wanted you back too because we are like super excited. We, we've been very excited since we had you here and even before about your film. Um, and it's come out now. It was premiered, and we just want to hear all about what you've been doing this past few months. Okay, so. Uh, I'm going to tell you, and I'll give you a, like a, a little mini lesson in film distribution while I'm at oh, it. <laughs> so so it, it hasn't technically been released yet. It's in its film festival run, um, which means that it's playing at different festivals. And so you might be able to see it at a festival or at a, re a regional like online availability during the festival. But it's not, it hasn't been publicly released yet. So um, it's interesting because uh, it used to be before the pandemic that when a film was at a festival, you could only see it if you went to that town and sat in a theater seat to see it. Um, and it was, you know, low key, like people didn't really think about it being available yet because it was just doing these festivals. Now, because festivals are um, putting their films virtually online as well as sometimes in the theater. Um, it gives the impression that it's out, <laughs> it's out. And, and so people keep emailing me saying, why can't I see the film <laughs> where I am? And I'm like, it's not out yet, <laughs> but that makes no sense, right? <laughs> Cause distribution is stupid. So let's say that it premiered at the end of September at the Woodstock Film Festival in Woodstock, New York, which was great. It was the first time, uh, we watched it with a live audience. <laughs> so that was kind How of How was amazing. that? What was that? What was that like? What was there? What was the overall sound or sense of the, the people in the room? Like what, what energy were you getting from that? Um, well, there was definitely people were enjoying themselves. Like they were laughing at the right times. And then there were these little murmurs that would come up at different times in the film. Um, and when the film ended, um, uh, nobody left, like the, everyone stayed for the Q&A, which is a little bit unusual because there are always people who just like sort of duck out. Um, but everyone stayed for the Q&A, which is this level of engagement that like made me really happy. Um, uh, I think, uh, yeah, I think it was really enthusiastic. We had two screenings. Um, some of them contained my friends. So it was very enthusiastic and, and, but the second one did not, and it was still enthusiastic. So I feel like that's good. Um, yeah, it was really cool. And then, you know, people talked to us afterwards, you know, we heard from people who were child free, who were just like, I'm so glad there's a film about us. And, you know, like, uh, I like, I feel seen, you know, things like that, which was really, really nice. Um, but we also heard from like parents, um, one of one parent who was there told my editor that um, she was going to call up her child free friends and apologize for being so insensitive. Right. And I was like, wow, that's, that's wild. She's like, yeah, I had really had no idea. I need to apologize to them. And it's like, wow, I, not like, I didn't think about that as like, um, like a sort of a motivation, but um, yeah. So that was kind of cool. Um, 
I also had really interesting conversations based on your tweet today. Uh, I had conversations with people, with kids who said, I didn't ever even think I had a choice. Mm. Like kind of breaks my heart. Right. Um, yeah. it's like, I didn't, I didn't really know I had a choice. It's so interesting thinking about this. And I'm like, <laughs> I love my kids. You know, you know, they always like, I love my kids, which I believe they love their kids. But she's like, I didn't know. I didn't know that I didn't have to. <laughs> so I didn't want to. It's like, yeah. So that's still, uh, that's still like mind blowing. I think that's a win that you, you may, you are making, inspiring somebody, let me put it this way, inspiring someone to call their child three friends and apologize. I wanted to bring, can we bring it back to Canada for a second? Cause I wanted to, to set a scenario and, and ask your, get your opinion on it. Um, because you are putting something out there that is so, I mean, it's not just making a statement. I mean, you're, you're talking about the experience of not having kids or not wanting, or whether you're choosing to have kids or not. I'm not, are you familiar with the social? That's the daytime talk show here in Canada. Yeah, I am. Okay. okay. Yeah. So th- three weeks ago, and I, I didn't see this when it aired live, but I saw it last week or earlier this week. Um, they had a five minute segment on the child free hashtag trend that's happening on TikTok. And the two moderators of that conversation are child free by choice. And the uh, one of the guest co-hosts was also child free by choice. And one of them said, why is this a movement? One of the child free by choice women who, who has said on her blog, her website, she's a gossip columnist. She's publicly stated many times she happily doesn't want kids. She's like, why is this a movement? Why do we need to talk about this? And, and to me, I was like, but you talk about it. I mean, not in great detail, but she makes no bones about the fact that she's happily child free because she thought that well, I live a happy life. There's no need to make a movement around it because I'm not suffering. And so I wondered what you thought about that because you're, you've, this documentary is, I mean, I hope she sees it because to me, it just seems like, don't you realize there are people around the entire planet that don't feel seen, don't feel heard, don't feel respected. (laughs) This is why we're, this is why you're making such a documentary. And this is why we do the podcast. Like, what do you think about that? Well, I mean, I think that that kind of thing is like someone saying, well, I'm a middle-class white woman. I don't experience racism. I don't know what the big deal is, why we have to keep talking about racism. So it's, you know, kind of like that. Like your experience is your experience. It's not necessarily everyone else's experience. And yeah, I'm kind of surprised, but I've heard that too. I've heard people saying, oh, why are you making such a big deal out of it? And I'm like, I'm not the one making a big deal out of it. The whole world is making a big deal out of it. Like I have other identities besides being child free. That's not like my defining identity. And yet I keep banging up against things that keep reminding me that because I don't have kids, I have somehow failed in my duty, you know, as a woman. So, yeah, I mean, I think that that's a sort of um, very limited view of the world. Like if it isn't bothering her, why is it a problem? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that, but she'll have to see the film. I was gonna say, and then when you're a guest on that show, I'll be like, "Yep, see, <laughs> there's a reason." <laughs> yeah, I know. It's um, yeah, it's a little frustrating sometimes. I find that with every film I make, though, um, when I was making my film on virginity, people were like, "What's the big deal?" You know, like, why is this a big deal? Have sex? Don't have sex? Who cares? And I'm like. The entire abstinence until marriage movement is going to tell you you're going to hell if you do have sex. And if you're a girl and you have sex and it's entirely your fault and you have, um, you know, made this happen, made a man want to have sex with you, you know, like the whole thing. It's like, yes, it's a thing and it affects people's lives and it affects people's value and it affects um, the way other people see them. These are all things if it isn't affecting you personally awesome great you know but this this is actually also you know when you talk about like the child free movement i i often say i don't think we're organized enough to actually be a movement yet <laughs> like i think we I have agree. some work to do <laughs> i agree <laughs> we we're really like- want to be a movement. <laughs> some are here some are there we're not sure if we're child free or childless or child free by pet circumstance, t- like what? Well, there's so many different. 
<laughs> Isabel's like, what are you talking about? No, that nobody, because we, we can't even defi- have a definition. I mean, it's yeah, yeah. we're, we I don't, I, I would have to agree with you. I don't think we're anywhere near the level of being a movement. Yet. Yeah. We have to work a little harder. To <laughs> I think so. Yeah. But, I mean, we're, we're a young, well, we can't sort of call ourselves a movement. We're, we're a young community because um, I mean, we're not the first people who are child free. We're not the last that's for sure. But I mean, I think internet has made easier for us to connect with other people around the world. And it's just been in the past, maybe five or six years that we've seen this community like speak up louder, I would say. So we're still like in diapers uh, (laughs) in a a way. Great analogy. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So let's try not to shoot the bed. There you go. (laughs) We're still in kindergarten. We need parenting. I mean, there was, so this is in the film, but like in the 1970s, there was um, a group called the National Organization for Non-Parents that you might be familiar with. Yeah. And it was like a sort of an out and proud group of, of people who didn't think, who thought it was perfectly fine not to have children, basically. And they were aligned with zero population growth. So some of their motivation had to do with population issues. Um, but they were out and they're the ones that invented internet, a National Child Free Day. I, I think it was non-parent day back then um so they were like i think they were pretty like out there uh in the public sphere but then you know the 80s happened and conservatism and reagan and every interesting thing that happened in the 70s got kind of tamped down and we had to figure it out all over again from the beginning yeah Um, one of the leaders of that uh national alliance for non-parents was ellen peck right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She was just so unapologetic, unapologetically child-free. And she was like in your face, 1970s. Like, and she wrote a lot of like really interesting things. I guess maybe we need more people like her actually. Yeah. She was really, um, she was really great. And she's also, there's some clips of her in the film also. Um, yeah. She's fantastic. And she's cool also, like she's really cool. But I, I'm gonna say that there are a lot of people now doing that kind of work, being like super badass and super articulate, including the child free girls, um, you know, who are, who are telling these stories and, and basically I think influencing how people think about their own lives and how they think about the world. Um, I would love to be like more organized around some of the issues that might be like really relevant to to people who don't have children or don't want children. Things like reproductive justice, for example, it's not an exclusively child free thing. um, But I think that we, especially since we really do not want to have children and don't want to be pregnant, I think that we should be really uh, vested in getting, um, making things a lot better in this country in terms of like controlling our own fertility and our own bodies Um, and, you know, work, work stuff. You know, we saw COVID how people without kids were asked to work longer hours. I understand why, but a lot of people weren't compensated and didn't really have a choice in whether they're going to do it or not. Um, I think those kinds of workplace issues, I think child-free people should be interested in making it, it better um, climate change, population issues. Um, yeah. So there are a lot of things that as people who don't have children and don't want children, um, we really should have an interest in and in making change because it, it does affect us directly. So I'm all for a movement. We just have to like agree on stuff. Like if we're still having arguments about who gets to call themselves child-free, like it's going to be like a while before anything gets sorted out. And we are still having arguments. Oh yeah. I feel like that was a lot of gatekeepers in our community. I, yeah. I feel like it's not going to go away anytime soon. That's the sad, like that argument because it, it just, because it's so new, that term is still so seems so new. Don't, don't you guys think like, it's just, there, there's always going to be people discovering like younger people discovering that there's a term and whether they agree with it or not or mm-hmm. you know, disagree about what feminism is <laughs> that's 
true. And that movement, that that's a movement, right? Like, I don't, I don't even really know <laughs> what, if I am or not or whatever, because it, everyone's got a different, different idea of how you should be if you're a feminist. It feels like and what you should think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So child free could be the same thing because like if Zuli who says, you know, you can't look at a kid, <laughs> if you look at a child, you're not child free. I mean, if you're an aunt or if you have a pet, you're not child free. I mean, we have those, that mentality, you know, that mentality exists is what I mean. You know, then we're, we're going to be yeah. at this for a long time. Yeah. I think there are people who are just unhappy and um, this is how they express their unhappiness. I think. Mm-hmm. But there was an interview be- you did, Therese, with a, I, sh- I didn't write down, uh, I should have written down the guy's name, but it was a, like a video slash radio interview with a guy who was sitting in his living room or office. There was a futon behind him. Mm-hmm. Um, and he asked you, he asked you something about your choice to not have children. Mm-hmm. And then you said, well, no, I, I feel like it chose me. And he said, so you're correcting me. And he meant that in ter- like for himself, like wanting to understand where you were coming from. And you said that until that moment, you hadn't really thought about um, whether it was a conscious choice, I think, or whether it was something that you just always were. Like there was something, you said something about having not thought about it in that way before. And mm-hmm. I just wondered if you could go into that a little, because I think it's really interesting, especially because so many of the people in your documentary say things like, I always knew I didn't want children, but I expected to, I expect to have them someday anyway. And does always knowing, is that the same as choosing not to, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for mentioning that. That was a, that was a good interview. That was with film wax, um, uh, which is a, like a YouTube video podcast <laughs> show that's like child free girls. Um, yeah. And yeah, he asked me, he said, so you're child free by choice, right? Yeah. And at that moment I thought, yeah, it wasn't really a choice. Actually. I think by choice is a bit of a misnomer because I didn't sit down and go, well, I've decided I'm not going to have kids. It's just like, I don't want kids. I don't want to be a parent. And I don't know how long I knew that, that I don't remember ever actively like deciding that. Um, Mm -hmm. And that was a really interesting moment because it's very rare, you know, when you're talking to somebody in an interview say, um, and you have some kind of like insight, like as you're answering a question. Um, But but for me, yeah, for me, it's true. And, And having said that, that I always kind of knew I didn't want kids. I always knew that parenthood was not something I was interested in. Um, having said that, yeah, I did always assume I would have kids anyway. Yeah. I had no feel like for you. You mean growing up? Yeah. Just knowing you didn't have this, uh, desire, but then kind of seeing it out there in your future. (laughs) Well, um, I was kind of resigned to it. Um, I was kind of resigned to it because I didn't have any role models around me that were presenting anything else. And the people who didn't have children were always objects of pity. Like, oh, you know, it's so sad. They never had kids. Um, I didn't know any like people who just decided they didn't want them. Um, so, so I just assumed, I mean, this, if this is all you see, this, it's like people who say, I didn't know I had a choice. I have a lot of empathy for that, because um, if you don't see a choice, you don't think you have a choice. Right. And it takes a lot of internal strength to make that choice under those circumstances, I think. I really thought like, I better do everything I wanna do because as soon as I have kids, my life is gonna be over. Um, so I better like do all of these things. Um, and I think it's, I don't know if, if you guys have ever had this feeling, but it's like when you're growing up, like there are things you want and things you think you have to do. And there's always this argument going on inside about that. Like you kind of know that what you want to do is not what you're supposed to do and are going to do. And there's a part of you that wants to go along with everybody else and be like your friends. And, you know, that's how you have, that's how you get the the respect and approval, you know, by going along and doing all these things. Um, 
that was like, that was much of my twenties and thirties basically. Um, and I remember being in a very serious relationship and all of our friends were getting married and, and having kids. And I thought, well, we have to do that too. You know, we have to get married and have kids because it was not, I didn't feel good, you know, about that. I didn't feel good that I was like just dating this guy and there were like, I don't, didn't know what would happen to us down the road. And yeah, so it's a really weird feeling. And yet I didn't want any of that <laughs> as has previously been established. So um, yeah, and I actually broke up with him because I was like, this isn't going anywhere, you know? I mean, can you, Matt, like, I think back at that, like, wow, I was so confused. Um, this isn't going anywhere. I don't think we should keep dating. Cause I was thinking I'm 36. I, I need to get going if I'm gonna, like, like, what was I thinking? Um, and then by the time I was like 40, um, I kind of like came through the other side and, and realized that you never wanted that. You don't want that. It hasn't happened. That's a good thing. You won. <laughs> You got what you wanted, but yeah, it's a weird thing. What, what the mind does to you, um, when you're so, you're so surrounded by these messages that this is what success means, you know, this you know, is what you yeah. said earlier that, and we've all kind of agreed that people don't, so many people don't understand why we have to talk about this, but it's, it's interesting, but not interesting how minimized or dismissed or ignored that feeling of uh have to and mine was um I don't think I assumed it would happen someday I was afraid it would happen someday like it but it was still mm -hmm. kind of a no choice sort of thing I was just like why do I have to do this it really pissed me off I, I just everything about it felt wrong um, and I think a lot of people probably experience that and worse because they're in situations where they actually don't have a choice um, and I think th that feeling of your life going in a direction you don't want it to go permanently is so um, disregarded as, as nothing. Whereas I just read a post on Medium by a woman who um, is suffering, I guess, what she calls secondary infertility. She already has three kids, but she wants another one and she she's having a hard time having that child. So she's having... Um, the feelings people have when they are infertile. And I'm sure people all over the place are, are for reasons, you know, feeling very bad for this woman, you know, like, oh no, you can't have a fourth child. I'm so sad for you because she wants to have this child with her, with her present, uh, with her, her spouse. And I don't know, like it really disturbs me not be, I mean, I, I'm glad that she has the empathy. I feel for her that she's having a hard time with this, but it just is infuriating that people refuse to acknowledge or have such a hard time understanding the intense emotional and psychological pressure of to have a child when you desperately want a different life, you know? And, and that's, I think that should be added to the list of things, you know, in this child-free movement, if it ever materializes is the the truly devastating and lasting and like just crushing um, impact of that kind of pressure and the psychological and emotional impact on those who have kids when they didn't want them and they were pressured into it and then the impact on those kids. Mm -hmm. Right. And you're not allowed to say anything about that. Also, it's such a taboo. You know, you can't, you can't talk about that. Yeah, I know. It's really, um, I think that that like what you're expressing was some of what people were expressing after the screenings that they hadn't really thought about. Like, I just didn't think about it this way. And I didn't really understand what my friends were dealing with and, you know, things like that. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a really real thing. Just the idea that you can't force someone to have a child, like you cannot force someone to have a child. Um, it's horrifying. And yet it happens all the time. You know, it happens know. all what the time. What do you mean? Why not? She's a woman. That's what they do. That's right. Yeah. No. Oh, but you're blessed to be pregnant. What, you know, that's a blessing. Mm -hmm. Things like that. Or you have to have a baby or I'm going to leave you, which also, if you just spend any time on the regretting motherhood Facebook page, 
It's like every scenario on there of how this all happens. Yeah. Yeah. Forcing anyone to have a child and like <laughs> the effect on your life when you have a child is so profound, so profound in so many ways. The idea that you would force someone to do this is obscene, obscene. <laughs> um, I'm not sure people sit down and think about that fully, like the full implication of that. Cause they try and trap you with the love conversation, like the meaning and the, and, and just the, the purpose, you know, they, they throw out those words at you to make it seem like that's the only way you're going to achieve that level of whatever it is they're telling you. Do you think by more people speaking up about their child-free experience or their desire to not have kids, do you think that will open up more conversation or, or even help people that had kids and regret it quietly? Do you think that will somehow create a way for them to speak up, even if they just admit it privately to one person? I mean, I, I think so. I mean, we, we, uh, you know, we, we live these lives and we're told the right and wrong way to live our lives all the time, like in, in so many, from our families, from our religious institutions, from our pop culture, it's constantly like reinforcing this. And um, I mean, so many people feel like they're the only person who feels a certain way. And then they discover that in fact, many people feel like they do, but we're so isolated that we don't know it. So I think any conversation like this really, I think, helps people um, to, this just validates their feelings and they're not the only people who feel this way. And it's not just for, you know, wanting children or not wanting children. I mean, the queer community has been going through this for a long time now. Um, and I think social media has been really helpful in bringing people together and realizing that you're not the only person who ever felt this way ever in the world. Um, and I think anonymous social media is, has been helpful too in that way that you can put stuff out there and you're not like putting yourself at, at risk. Um, Reddit is a real good platform for that actually. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And this is like, I think, and you probably get this too, but you know, every uh, few weeks I encounter somebody who was like, I didn't even know people were talking about this. You know, and and they're, they're like, I just can't believe it. Or or when I say, just use the hashtag child free and see what you find. <laughs> you might find some things um, when people are like, oh, I don't really, I haven't talked about this with anyone. And I'm like, hashtag child free, just see what happens. You know, this is just a quick thing of things like surprising things people hadn't heard of, because once you start talking about something long enough, you just start to assume everybody knows about it. And and then someone commented on some previous thing I'd written on Medium and they were like, oh, pronatalist, what a great word. Thanks for giving us a word to describe this, you know, this uh, push to have parents. And, I, and it took me a second to, to, to remember that not some people don't even know that there is stuff anywhere to read about this stuff. Or like you said, that anyone's even talking about it. So it was like, oh, wow, you've never even heard the word pronatalist before. And I wish I could take credit for making it up. <laughs> <laughs> You know what I have? So I've been doing a, a lot of press, you know, since the film premiered and um, there's, there are very few people I have talked to that have heard the word pronatalist before. And they're like, Oh, cool. That's a good word. I'm like, yeah. So we, we, we can plant that, that rumor that Kristen Tetsy made that word up. <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah. yeah, Kristen, <laughs> brilliant that you finally found a term to fully express <laughs> this, we, this we, pressure. We, we, we knew we brought her on to child for girls for a reason, right? Isabel? <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. I'm just going to credit you from now on. <laughs> It'd be great. But yeah, people, people aren't familiar with the word and it's such a helpful word. You know, I think it's a really like, yeah, it just, it, it is what it is. And now that it has, now that there's a word for it, it's a thing that exists, this pressure, this being pressure, being forced to have children. So I do I had a question about maintaining momentum based on what Kristen said, you know, like when you've been talking about this for a couple of years and it feels like everyone should know this, but there's always new people being introduced to the child community or even to the fact that it's a choice. So it took you what, five years to make this documentary or longer? Yeah. Yeah. About five years. So 
how do you stay encouraged when you're working on something? I mean, I mean, this is even just for someone who's just starting a blog, but I mean, you've, you've, you've really created a, uh, an impressive body of work. So how do you stay motivated for that long when, you know, it, it takes a while to build anything of quality and you know, you, you have a vision and you're making it happen, but I, I, I'm assuming that you came to some points where you're like, oh my God, how do I keep going? Like, how, how do you stay motivated? Um, that's such a good question. And I mean, you know, Kristen, you wrote a book. I'm sure there's the same level of sort of long-term kind of trying to, you know, sticking with it. Right. Um, but, uh, well, the first thing is I, so I'm a, I'm a truly independent filmmaker. Like I decide what I want to make. I figure out how to raise the money and get it done. And then once it's completely done, (laughs) then I decide like how to get it out into the world. So I have, so because I want to do that, um, I can pick my own topics. So I pick topics I'm really obsessed with. And once I feel like I'm fully obsessed with a topic, I mean, you have to be really obsessed. I do. I have to be completely obsessed with what I'm working on. Um, But there are other things too. I mean, you know, I started working on this in 2016, I think. And in 2017, I had a Kickstarter campaign. And that's, if anyone's done a Kickstarter, it's like a ridiculous amount of work. It's a very unhealthy thing, but it's a way to make money in a society that doesn't support the arts. So, so we raised like $45,000 with that Kickstarter. Um, But the other important thing is that we got, you know, well over 600 backers. So now there are 600 people in the world that are invested in you finishing this project. And that's pretty powerful, actually, to know that it's not just me, you know, but but like 600 other people have have uh, invested, literally put their money into this project um, because they wanted it to exist in the world. Um, I have, you know, followers on social media where it's a little bit of the same thing, like like you want to keep keep this conversation going. And I feel like I kind of, I kind of owe it to the people who have been supporting the project in one way or another to finish the project, to, you know, deliver this project. So that's actually pretty helpful. It helps knowing that other people are waiting for it and want it. I mean, there are times when I didn't want to work on it, like absolutely did not. I said, this is going to sound awful, but I remember working with, um, my editor, Siobhan Dunn, who's amazing. And I remember it was just a really hard time. I just wasn't able to solve like some creative problems. She and I were just not sure how to move forward. Um, And I said, you know, if I was diagnosed with a terminal illness, I would just walk out of this office and never come back again. (laughs) She's like, what? (laughs) Like, where are you going in your head right now? (laughs) And I'm like, if I had six months to live, I would not spend it making this film. Um, that's kind of how I felt. Like, no, I don't want to leave a legacy. No, I don't care. <laughs> I don't ever want to look at it again. So that's kind of how I, I also feel sometimes, which is like, I just can't, I just can't, I can't do it. But um, I, I have the experience now of doing this in mostly understanding it's a process. And if you're working with good people and, and, you know, you believe in the thing that you're doing. Uh, if you can trust it, that the process will take you through somewhere that that actually works, then it will happen. Um, although the moment that I didn't have to make any more creative decisions, like, you know, you get to a point where the film is edited and then there's a lot of technical things you have to do. You have to make the color consistent and beautiful. You have to work with your audio person to make everything sound great. Um, you know, things like that. Um, but you don't have to be creative anymore. Like, like you told the story, you figured out how to tell the story and it's done. That was like the greatest moment in my life where I thought I don't have to make another fucking creative decision on this film. And it is fantastic. <laughs> now I'm just going to watch people on computers, you know, do things. That was you sent your film off to college. <laughs> I did. That's right. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. Um, <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, if we're going to do that analogy, um, I think in the way that people who have had um, who have given birth to babies say, like, you forget how horrendous the the birth process was, (laughs) you just forget. And then 
there you go again. And I feel like it's like that too. It's like, I just forget, I forget how horrendous the Kickstarter was to do. Um, and I have been told several times now to, to write myself a letter, seal it in an envelope and just put in the event that I want to do another Kickstarter campaign open, you know, or I want to make another movie. You know, There's like the letter from me going, don't, don't do it. Don't, don't do it. It's going to, do you have another one uh like another thing another thing you're obsessed with that you want to um put out there communicate argue because it seems like what you've done so far is kind of like a look this is the way it is this is what you don't understand about what's happening with with women is there something just sort of bugging you well it's kind of interesting because I did a film about virginity and now I did a film about motherhood. So it's like the, the maiden, the mother and the crone, you know, that's like the Trinity. So I think my next film has to be about the crone. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm completely fascinated with menopause and the way that we don't talk about menopause and have no good information about menopause and all the you know, mythology around what happens to women. And, I mean, it's the same, like there are so many things about women's lives where we're just being told things that aren't true and people just take it as accepted knowledge. Um, like all women want children, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, so that's something I've been really interested in. Um, I don't want to do another project where I have to raise ridiculous amounts of money because I can't get a grant uh, or anything. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of wary about that. Like, I just don't want to do that again. I'm hitting a milestone birthday and it's like, do I really want the next chapter of my life, the final chapter of my life to be about like raising money and being frustrated? And, you know, do I really want to do that? Um, so I'm kind of trying to figure out like how to deal with those very complicated feelings. Um, but that's a topic I'm really interested in that we just like just touch on in the film actually lightly. Um, but even that, that was a moment where there was a murmur through the crowd. It's like, she's talking about menopause. She's talking about menopause, you know? And it was like this sort of murmur of like, like people were glad. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm interested in. Um, and if there are any nice, rich ladies out there who would like to <laughs> fund it. It totally seems like a Reese Witherspoon thing like it yes. just seems like as a filmmaker you should just be able like all the, so many women have their own production companies now like these rich you know actors Mindy Kaling women. Mindy Kaling anybody yeah. anybody that's done anything that's involved Reese Witherspoon in the last six <laughs> years go target yeah. the, I, I agree I feel because even that content the stuff that's mainstream the mini series I mean there's amazing content but it's still shying away from these topics it's talking about affairs divorce women's struggles raising kids but it's not talk talking about it's talking about abuse but it these topics are still swept under the rug in mainstream media it seems like yeah you know and it's it's frustrating yeah not all of us are filmmakers i mean but jane fonda I, she has money and she's post menopausal yeah, I was just thinking about Grace and Frankie and how they actually talked about menopause in Grace and Frankie. And yeah, I mean, it's great. It's brilliant. Um, yeah. Um, I want to tell you that um, without, you know, naming any names, it has been impossible to, to get a show about a child-free woman off the ground. Yikes. Hmm. We're not surprised. <laughs> no, but why, why is, like, in your opinion, why is that? It seems like an obvious question, but... Well, you know, uh, I think men still <laughs> run the show. Men run the show and they're not interested in this. And I'm going to tell you, they're really not interested in menopause. <laughs> like, seriously, <laughs> not <laughs> interested in menopause. Uh, this is not something they want to spend time with. And I don't know if you guys have ever seen um, Amy Schumer's uh, skit, Last Fuckable Day. Are you familiar with this? I don't thing? know if I saw that one. I think it's just brilliant. It's basically like it's um, Julia Louis-Dreyfus is turning 50 
and she attends a party that, you know, like Amy Poehler and Tina Fey, and I don't remember who else are throwing for her because it's her last fuckable day. Like according to Hollywood. That was good. It it's so good. good. It's so good. Um, and um, it's, it's played straight, which is why like, wow. it's so good. It's like, this is the last day anyone will ever, you know, think of you in Hollywood as someone that would, someone would want to have sex with. Um, I, I uh, encourage everyone to look up that skit because I think about it all the time, like all the time. But I, but I do think that the, this is, I mean, even, you know, um, Kristen, the interview that you referenced on Film Wax. So, I mean, Adam was great and it was a great, um, it was a great interview and I had a really wonderful time. And then I remember mentioning like menopause and he was just kind of like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, menopause. <laughs> and I, is, and is I get it, this, I get this from, I mean, get this reaction just sort of generally from men. Like they're like, okay, okay. We don't have to talk about that. And I'm like, no, we do have to talk about it. Um, so it's, it's hard to do these kinds of things um, in a world where the gatekeepers are still not, mm. not really interested <laughs> Not really no, interesting. Man, they have no idea what to do with a woman once she becomes just a person, you know, mm. like because yeah. menopause obviously means old, which means obviously unattractive and also no sexy, sexy. So right. what are you then? You know, what do I even, what do a man is like, what do I even do with, with this, with this? With this person? person yeah. With this yeah. person who, who, uh, yeah, I can't like have sex with and I don't want to have <laughs> sex with. And I don't want to have kids with, and he can't have kids. So, I mean, forget that. Um, but, but the same, the same thing happens when, when with m- menstruation, like, oh, men can't talk like you can't talk about that. Like <laughs> men are just like, no, 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 I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Why? Yeah. Why are they so scared of our reproductive organs? I don't know. It's not sexy. It's what? It's not, it's sexy. not sexy. Periods aren't yeah. sexy. Yeah. Menopause isn't sexy. I really want to bring this subject up to the third men's panel we have for the child free convention. Cause I moderate that now. Yeah. <laughs> I want to bring that up because I I'm curious though, if child free men will be more receptive to talking about these sort of things, because they're already generally ba- you know, standing up for their wives' decisions and whatnot, you know, that, that might be a blanket statement, but we haven't heard a lot of from child free men, you know, really. And so I'm curious if, you know, these kind of conver- to, to see what they think about. I mean, it doesn't mean they're going to have any more of an understanding than anybody else, but the open mindedness to to learn or to listen, just to listen, uh, you know, when a, a, a woman is talking about the different things that we go through, you know, someone out there. Like, don't make it like, let's talk about menopause. Just kind of like Therese did, just I, sort of- I won't even tell them that Come up in conversation okay. and just see how they respond to that. Like, wow, I, you know, at least when I hit <laughs> menopause, I won't even have to worry about any of this anymore. Like, I was no. going to say, my, my screen will go blank. They will, but then they, because I have admin access, so they can't kick me out because I can get back on. But I'm just, just like, I could just see that happening. It's like, oh, technical difficulties. We lost Lenora. So. We lost Lenora. <laughs> Oh, well, let's just talk about something else. Exactly. I, but, but it makes me think because, you know, and there have been conversations more, more so like a meeting clubhouse where guys have been in the audience listening to us child-free women talk about the things that we go through. And we're always like, thank you to the two men in the audience who've sat through this hour. <laughs> We've talked about, you know, our periods and IUDs and, and hysterectomies and whatever else. Right. But right. So I'm just curious because we assume that child-free people in general are more open-minded to having harder conversations because we're already living a, a, a different life compared to most. So and I menopause was wondering- shouldn't even be a hard, I'm sorry. Sorry. yeah really but, that should be like exciting because you don't have to worry. you know oh yeah it's just, so just a fact of life it just yeah. is every woman who lives long enough goes through it mm-hmm. that's right and um and I think that um you know just like with our periods we have been taught not to talk about it because there's something shameful about it and I will add that if you grow up being told that the most important thing you're ever going to do is have a child and that is your purpose in the world and you're essentially a, a walking uterus, 
the day that you can't do that anymore mm-hmm. is like your death. You know, yeah. it's like, it's like your, your, your death in society. And after that, you just need to be, go somewhere and be quiet. Cause you know, you're not, you're not of use. So because men can still have kids up until, I mean, Pierre Trudeau had a child at 71, I believe we were talking Possibly. about him before possible. Yes. Yeah. He had, he had, he fathered a, another child in his seventies. So wow. yeah. yeah, he had three, three sons. Actually, one of his sons was in a, in an accident and died. Yeah. Really yeah. sad story. Um, but yes, yeah. Men can, men can father children until they're quite old. Although there are serious health risks for those kids when, when the father is that old. So it's not just like, Oh, piece of cake, you know? Um, I, I, I was, I'm sorry to interrupt you. There is such a thing as andropause as well, like like male menopause, Ooh. but it's not really the same way that we, like, right. you know, female body people have to leave it, you know? Right. You guys are making up words like Kristen's made up pronatalism. Isabel just made <laughs> up this other word. <laughs> I'm like, have I heard about that? Well, and also men are allowed to not be sexual beings, you know? I mean, there was uh, someone... Someone tweeted something. It was, uh, it was Jennifer. It was an author who posted a picture of a guy of your who was described as being distinguished, heavy of, of being of distinguished ugliness. And she joked that maybe his ex-wife or somebody had written this this description. And you know, like, why would anyone say this? And I and my only response is, it's okay if you're a guy. You can be, you can be uh, just any, any non-traditional, like whatever traditionally attractive is, if you're not that, doesn't right. matter at all. Right. Okay. So, and, and, and so if you suddenly, you know, hit andropause, is that what it is? Okay. <laughs> if Good you word. hit that and it affects <laughs> your, your virility or your sexual bonerisms, it doesn't matter. I mean, except for how you feel about whether you can, you know, have sex, but otherwise it's not like men are concerned about whether anybody finds them fuckable. Well, they just, they assume. just assume they will be thought fuckable. Yeah. I if think. women had that attitude, would that change everything? If, if all women had that same attitude, I would like us to adopt it. I would really like us to stop talking about about stop seeing my body, stop seeing me only as a sexual creature while I show you pictures of my ass to get approval. Just stop seeing yourself that way. Stop presenting yourself that way and just be it. Be what you want to have seen. You know, mm-hmm. if you don't want it to be about your tits, don't tell me I must look at and appreciate your tits because you're a woman. I mean, God, get enough of that. <laughs> I mean, I think the thing is like our world is constructed a certain way like on purpose, it's constructed a certain way. And it's based on certain ideas about women's roles and why we are important and valuable. And um, I, I always think, you know, we as women did not make the rules. We were not in the rooms when things were being decided. Um, Our welfare was not really taken into consideration over the millennia. Um, and we live in a society that is constructed to make people feel that way, to feel that like their value is wrapped up in what they look like, their value is wrapped up in how many kids they can have, the value is wrapped up in like things like that. And I think even though I think there's a lot of pushback, which is cool, it, this is still kind of the world, it's called patriarchy. Hey, I'm, I think we should use this word patriarchy. What do you think? Patriarchy, there does need to be a word for that. Overrider. There needs to be a word for that. I yeah. like that word. Geez, you guys are so brilliant. Like you're sitting here making up words left, right, and center. I, I need to get on my game here. Jeez. But we can, yeah. but those, but we can at least, um, inst- like we're the only ones who can change that, you know? I mean, even if it's going to be slow, as soon as you recognize that this thing is a problem, stop doing it. Yeah. I mean, I, that's true. We can't like beg our, our oppressors, you know, to stop oppressing us that was the thing about the vote you know like like women were campaigning for the vote for so many decades because they had no power to make any change like they had to convince the people with the power the men who voted um to do something like to do the right thing because they had no power themselves and that's this you know yes like how do you keep going 
you know, like as Lenora was asking, how do you keep going on these things? And you, it's like sheer, sheer will um, to make a change because it's so important that that, that, that change be made. Um, but yeah, I don't want to be all downer about this stuff, but yeah, um, it's, uh, but, you know, we're, do we're doing something here. We're yeah. talking about changes. I mean, just knowing that you're not the only person that feels a certain way, you know, that like that old feminist phrase, the personal is political, it's not that old, but the personal is political. Like your personal experiences are not necessarily just your personal experiences. They're their experiences other people are also having because of the systems in our world, because the way the world is constructed, we all feel this kind of stuff. So once you can have those conversations realizing it's not your individual problem to solve, it's a much larger problem that everyone is um, suffering from, then you've given yourself a lot of power to get together with other people to do it. Otherwise, you're just being told, oh, this is just your problem. Stop complaining, you know, and, and so getting past that and getting to a place where it's like, OK, a lot of people apparently feel the same way I do. I don't think this is my problem. I think this is the world's problem. Um, so, again, that, and that gets back to why should we talk about it? It gets back to that host of the social. Like she doesn't have a problem. So why should we be talking about it? Because yeah. <laughs> because everyone else is having a problem with it. And even people for whom this isn't a personal problem should consider it a problem with the world. Mm -hmm. This is the nice thing about people going, oh, I, I want to talk to my childhood friends about this because I realize now that, you know, that there's something going on. The, and, and Lenora, I love, I love the last panel you did with the guys. I really enjoyed it. And um, I, was, I was going to like type in, so I want to know who here is involved in the, in the, uh, pro-choice, pro-abortion, you know, movement. And you asked it who, who was pro-choice, which was, I think, a really good question. But I want to know more. I want to know what they're doing about it. I, I, our, our next Child Free Convention meeting, I'm going to bring this up that we want to get a little more. Yeah, I, 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 I see some questions format forming because we did get, there were some people that asked those questions. They wanted you to know a little bit more about, you know, supporting abortion and a woman's like, do you leave her in charge of the birth control? You know, a, a lot more into the bodily functions of women, but there was just so much stuff that came up that we ran out of time. But now I'm, I'm seeing, yeah, okay. Whether I tell them beforehand or not, we're going to talk about this is another story, but you know, I, I feel like child free guys need to speak up. So yeah, they do need yeah. to speak up. And you know, it's yeah. a start. It's a start because we talk about all the other, you know, men who just shut down the interviewers. If, if we use our resources, which is maybe like the ha two handfuls of child-free men that we all know, if we can somehow get them to speak up, maybe other dudes will take notice who don't even have to be child-free, but it's a, you know, hopefully a ripple effect that makes other men think because then, you know, we can get projects in mainstream funded or at least acknowledged or seen to some level yeah you know you because somewhere. yeah exactly so yeah. obsessed you do have to be obsessed yeah i can't wait for that panel i'll send you some more questions yes please because then because then the guys won't we'll have to like i'm like i'm not making this up there's somebody else who wants these questions asked please send them to me and oh yeah we'll That'll help. Yeah. yeah. We definitely need to carry on the conversation. Um, and okay, before we let you go, the, one of the reasons why you were here today is also because you want to tell us about an event coming up. Um, so yeah. we'd um, love to hear about that. Thank you for asking. Um, so uh, since the film's been screening in festivals and available sort of here and there, I've, I've been getting a lot of emails. When can I see the film? How do I see the film? I really want to see the film, which like, thank you, thank you, thank you. That makes our day when we get those kinds of emails. Um, we decided to do a little event. Um, I, I believe it's going to be December 2nd in the evening. It, it, we're going to show a couple of clips from the film. And the theme is going to be surviving the holidays as a child-free person. And we're gonna show a couple clips that I think have to do with the kind of shit we hear all the time <laughs> about why we should have children. And uh, we're gonna have a few people talking about it and we're gonna um, 
answer questions and give advice for anybody who wants to, you know, share their own experiences. I think it's going to be a really fun evening. Um, and uh, that's pretty much all I can say about it right now. But um, I think it'll be great. And it'll be really cool to share a couple scenes from the film with everybody. That'll be really fun. Oh, for sure. Um, yeah. So, so um, we'll have more information as things develop. And, um, you know, our, our website is myselfishlife.com. I know you're, you'll include that. Um, we'll have a page for it. And um, I always encourage people to sign up for our first to know list. Our first to know list guarantees you will literally be the first to know <laughs> any opportunities to see the film, to see scenes from the film, whatever events we're having. And you can do that through our website also. So that's the best way to know what's going on. So yeah, so we're looking, really looking forward to doing that. We're looking forward to having more um, full screenings of the film in different regions where we're in a festival and, um, and then doing a public release next year sometime, which would be great. That sounds so good. We're look, we're still looking forward for the public release. <laughs> Just, I want <laughs> to bring wait. that film down here to Colombia. Are you going to like translate it in different like? subtitle it in different languages you definitely should do that I would love to see that film here yeah um yeah we've done that with previous films we've had like volunteer translators um who have helped us with the translations um yeah we'd really like to do that I mean I want to show this film internationally um because there are conversations going on all over the world as we know all over the world people are talking about this issue and they may have their own angles on it but um this is a global conversation and we want to get this film out globally so we can be part of that, part of that conversation. So keep your emails coming, follow us on social media. Um, we really love the conversations we're having. Absolutely. We're going to leave as always uh, all the links down in the description of this episode. So you can go to my so-called selfish life's website and you can follow three also on social media and keep up to date with all the things that are coming for this film because we things. I'm like I I don't know if have you girls watched um the how to lose your virginity I have to just say that the trailer that I've seen for my so-called selfish life is hilarious especially when there's that I've said I've I've left this comment for you before the politicians is that's like how, so, like I'm paraphrasing how do we fix global uh, climate change and he points to a photo of like all these babies <laughs> Yeah, that's you know, right there, it's just like, oh, that's Lord. This, this is the solution to climate change. Yes. Baby. Yeah. Babies. Babies. His timing is so good. Yeah, that's Senator Mike Lee from Utah. He's an absolute piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> but he makes he makes for a great clip for the film. So we're really happy about that. Awesome. I mean, the, the reason I brought up How to Lose Your Virginity is because that documentary was so funny and so interesting and just there's so much about it that I'm sure we're also going to see in my so-called selfish life because that's that's the reason that's who you are mm -hmm. and you know putting your your own like personal stamp on all the work that you do is you know, what we love about you so Thank we're you. like proud ants because we had you on while you were still <laughs> filming it so oh, yeah we, we're, we're like proud ants to the film I think is what it it feels like. yeah can I just tell you guys there is a thank you to the child free girls in the credits Aww. Aww. thank you Aww. you're welcome <laughs> that's awesome um so folks can go to um trixiefilms.com for all the films there are some shorts all the shorts are free to watch um and then the longer ones are uh pay-per-view pay situation all right yeah. is, is there anything else you would like to add to this interview therese before we Me? wrap up yep <sighs> um yeah, just to say, like, it's always a pleasure being here. And I'm like a massive Child Free Girls fangirl, <laughs> as I hope you know. Um, so it's nice to be back here. And uh, I look forward to some time when all four of us can get together and have a martini <laughs> or something. Um, and definitely when, when, uh, when we can do a wide release for the film, we can talk again. So thanks. And please, please go to our website, myselfishlife.com for every possible thing you want to know about the film, including our very fun new trailer. Thank you so much. And thank you for being here. We love thanks. having you here. 
And Love. for everyone who is listening or watching us, this is it, the end of our episode for today. We hope you really enjoyed it. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, anything that you want to communicate to us, you can send us an email to childfreegirls at gmail.com. We promise we read all our emails. Sometimes it takes a little bit to answer them, but we read them all. We promise. And you can visit our website at childfreegirls.com. Uh, and if you are watching this on YouTube, hit the button, subscribe. It helps a lot. And if you're not, if you're listening to us, on, just go to YouTube and hit subscribe anyway. And if you're a politician from YouTube, from YouTube, Utah, we will still like to talk to you. So please contact us. <laughs> um, you can find us all over social media at, uh, at Child for Girls on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok. We are on Amazon. Our book, uh, Child for Girls Comfort Food for Thought, is available in paperback and, and on Kindle. We are also on Clubhouse. You can find us at Child Free Club. Join us. We have daily conversations. And I think that's it for social media. Twitter? Did I say Twitter? I don't remember. Yeah, We're you also did. on Twitter. <laughs> I have two questions for the audience. The first is Do you know a wealthy producer for <laughs> Teresa's next documentary? If you do, please contact her. Please. This woman is making valuable, valuable stuff. Uh, and we need to see more of it. And she's hitting her milestone birthday. So, you know, help her not do fundraising, please. And my other question is, this goes back to the conversation we had earlier about what Therese said in her interview about um, uh, not having children for her, not really being a choice as much as it was just a part of her. Kind of like how you don't say someone isn't a doctor, like not a doctor by choice. I mean, you just you just don't wanna be a doctor, so you're not. Um, in your situation, are you someone who consciously chose not to want children after maybe thinking about what parenting involves? Maybe you thought you wanted kids and you decided, oh no, maybe I don't. Or was it just something that simply never occurred to you as something you wanted? And so it wasn't necessarily a choice. Leave your comments below or send them to us in an email. Um, and yeah, and make sure you visit, uh, myselfishlife.com. And then also you can follow uh, Therese on Twitter at Trixie Films. That's going to be on Instagram. Yeah. yeah. See ya. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> no, you say bye. <laughs> no, you say bye. <laughs> oh my God, I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> you leave first. I'm going. <laughs> bye. Bye. <laughs>